I'm on six and a half. Yeah, yeah. I'm the northeast corner there with the wall. Park everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping notes. Number one, um, we will go through all the speakers tonight, so please don't worry about um, or getting an opportunity to speak. Uh, if everybody that wants, if everybody will please sign in on the sign-in sheet, it's uh, over there, Rebecca signing in. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll just go, I'm just going to go down the list in order as people signed up. So uh, if you don't want to say anything, you may uh, pass, um, and otherwise, uh, or you can get up and say something. We do have people online as well, and we will take comments from the online folks. A um, uh, couple things: we, uh, when you when you come up to speak, just, uh, if you could come to the uh, speaker for the phone is right here, so just uh, come to the come to the front of the room so that the people online can hear you as well. Uh, state your name and address. Uh, the comments and the reporting will be transmitted to the Metro Council's Labor, Economics, and Appropriations Committee. Uh, they will discuss this project at their next committee meeting, which is uh, May the 7th, 2024, at 3 p.m. in the Council Chambers. Um, and I should have said, I am Jeff O'Brien, with the uh, Executive Director with, with the Economic Development for Louisville Metro Government. Uh, so what, the way this will work tonight is I'll go through a brief presentation about the, the project. Uh, and then we'll take public comments. And that is that's the, the process for tonight. And once we get through all the comments, uh, we will adjourn. So we're ready to go. If we're ready. I'll go ahead and get the sign in sheet and then we'll um I'll give a quick presentation. Okay. All right, um, very quickly here, uh, the, this is the uh, project we're talking about is 810 Barrett, 768 Barrett, and 814 Vine Street, shaded in the uh, gray on the screen there, right here. Well, closer in on the site, so we're a little bit more zoomed in it's between Barrett, Vine Street, Breckenridge, and uh, Lampton Street. The proposed project is a mixed use project. It will include 440. Uh, apartments or condominium units, 20 cottage homes, uh, office and commercial space of 165,000 square feet, a hotel with 100 rooms and five rooftop condominiums, uh, parking garage with 850 spaces, uh, public green space will also be included. Uh, this is an overview of the approved uh, development plan that was in the pattern book for the uh, zoning process. Part of this process? I'm sorry. Are the cottages to be part of this project? Yes. Uh, the uh, the this is a rendering of the of the proposed building, and then this is the the cottage site. Again, so the properties that are included in the HIP development area are the former urban government center site and the former parking lot for the urban government center. That is the proposed development area. The requested TIF is a uh, would be a 20-year TIF. The expected investment is $249 million. $28.5 million will be invested in public infrastructure. Uh, this is a property tax only TIF, so there are no local occupational licensee or state property taxes. It's a local uh, ad valorem property tax um, request. Uh, 
Uh, the current revenue is being generated by the off the property is over $3,000. Uh, and the um, expected uh, the total expected revenue to Louisville Metro over uh, over the over the 20 year period is just over 25 million dollars. Uh, the way the property tax program works is the uh, the property tax tip works is that the developer is given a cap. That cap for the project is 20 million 316 819 dollars. Uh, that is 80% of the new incremental taxes that are generated. So on an annual basis, uh, of approximately $1 million is being generated by the property uh, with, the, with the proposed development. 800,000 of that would be rebated to the developer and the city would receive 209,000 uh, annually in the, in the property tax. The TIF requirements that are set forth by the ordinance and agreements that we have in place, there are at least 10% of the house, total housing units will be affordable for people making up to 80% area median income. Uh, there's a community benefits agreement that includes uh, donations to the neighborhood associations, um, donations for uh, enhancement of a park, conducting uh, parking and traffic studies, designating the steam, uh, portion of the steam plant building as a community center for its neighborhoods to use. Uh, the the uh, community benefits agreement also prohibits standalone package liquor and short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is agreement for using um, native plantings and assessing the health of the trees on, uh, on Breckenridge Street. Are there any further questions about the project after tonight's hearing, you may uh, contact me. That my email and my direct phone number are up on the screen there. Um, so please feel free to give me a uh, call or email if you have any questions. I'm going to stop sharing the screen, but I will put that back up there so that we can have uh, the larger screen for folks in my audience. With that, uh, we will go ahead and we will start taking comments. Run. And again, I'm going to go through, we will go through, for the folks that are online, uh, we will go through the people in the room first, and then we'll uh, come to the online folks. Okay, so the first person I have is Thomas Woodcock. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, uh, do I need to get to a microphone? Uh, yeah, just a few places. That's just so the folks online can hear you. Once you take this chair and just sit it up there. Just put it up here for everybody to have. What, right here? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas Woodcock, uh, 1375 South Brook Street, um, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, 40208. Um, I am speaking today um, in opposition to the TIF. Um, I believe that this is a bad deal for our city. Uh, after reviewing the TIF language, I think, I think it's important to go back to the background. We've had two years of secretive negotiations between the, the developer and the city without any public hearings, without any input. Um, what's happened from the original proposal to now, we don't know. We don't have any community benefits agreements signed except for possibly one. I don't know. We'd have to, it looks like they approved it, but they haven't signed it yet. Um, and I think that's the real problem here. We have a piece of public land. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to be built here. And I think when we just saw the descriptions of what kind of units are going to be here, remember under the TIF language, it's different from what he just presented. It says approximately. There are no binding conditions to say that there's going to be 440 apartments or economies that approximately. Everything's approximate. There's no binding time frame. So this $250 million investment could be, there's nothing here that keeps the developer from following this. What will end up happening is they'll pass the TIF. The developer will have the TIF. Then we, we won't be able to work something out. The, the developer could just sue the city and make make it make them turn over the property. So this is very important. I mean, obviously, we don't have time to discuss all those things, but there's no binding elements about what's going to be there, what it's going to look like. There's no binding elements about the time frame. This developer, to be honest, hasn't doesn't have a track record. This is a $250 million investment, right? You wouldn't let somebody come to your house and fix something without having saying, well, they've already done this before. This person hasn't done this before, and it, it's not going to work. Um, and that's why we're doing the TIF right now, because they haven't been able to make any progress in the last two years in these secretive negotiations. We have no idea what's happening. And now they're just saying, well, just give us the TIF and we'll figure out the development plan later, right? 
Um, uh, and I just think that go, switching to something, there is, you know, there has always been an alternative plan where we can have senior affordable housing, we can reuse, we can readapt the building. This is not something that this building, these buildings can still be reused. And, and the, all the original plans for a grocery store and a daycare and all the different things, the amenities, the city only gave that developer four months. And they were asking for, what, $13 million? So now we're at almost double that, right? We're asking for a $20 million TIF, but I think there's already been some public hearings about the city's gonna pay $5 million to, de to, de demo to clean up and demolish the buildings. There's gonna be a subsidy for the 800 car parking garage. You know, so once we're done, said and done here, we're gonna have spent 50, 60, 70 million dollars in subsidies for something we have no idea what's gonna happen. So this don't just think this this is this tip is just the tip of the iceberg. They're gonna be back and back and they're gonna be picking away at us and pulling those subsidies out. And you know, it's a hundred and sixty thousand square foot office tower when here in downtown Louisville we have almost forty percent vacancy in office. And probably with the shadow inventory, we probably have more like 50 or 60%. So it's just pull, it's taking public land, giving them a subsidy, and then pulling it away from stuff that's from our office buildings that are already depleted. And like I said, there's an alternative. There always was an alternative. I think the best thing to do is to reevaluate, to, to, to reject this TIF and get back to the alternative plan where we reuse and re, uh, re, adapt the build, uh, re, reuse the building for a community benefit that can help Paris Town, help the surrounding neighbors, generate some tax revenue, bring some people in, get it cleaned up. But you know, this just can't just sit empty and maybe someday there'll be some explanation what's been happening the last two years and four months. But I don't think I don't think we're ever gonna hear anything. But I think the to correct that wrong, I think the first thing to do is to stop this tip and the bad behavior where this began and where this is going. Cause uh, I think if this gets approved, there's not gonna be any building. There, there won't be any building. They're gonna take the TIF, they'll take another couple of years, maybe they'll knock the buildings down, maybe not, and we'll be in a worse condition. Let's go ahead and do the right thing and make them come up with a fully realized plan that's gonna be built with a time frame, with the development dollars, with all the conditions, and then they can have the subsidy, not to give them the subsidy prior. So, that's the point that Jeff. We're gonna go through the, we're gonna go through the testimony, okay. Oh. All right. Uh, next I mean, I've read the TIF, so I know. I know. You don't get anything until we build it. Okay. Next, but there's no, there's no binding elements in the TIF. Please. There's no binding elements with this. Please. So, you know. Just, just please. Please. There is there there is a rezoning. The process for the last two years, they've been going through the rezoning process, and there are no other subsidies but the TIF, which is a paid to incentive. All right, uh, yeah, Michael, there's Michael no, Zuckerman. There's no subsidies. Michael yeah. Zuckerman. There's no there's no there's no there's no subsidies. Michael yet. Zuckerman. No, he stepped up. He had taken a phone call. Okay. okay. Uh, Steve Wyden. Okay. I have my uh, text written down, so uh, more direct. Uh, Steve Weiser, 2862 Reedling Drive, 40206. I am an architect, historian, and author, but above all else, I'm a concerned citizen and a taxpayer. For the past 40 years, I have been involved in various civic projects whose goal was to make Louisville the best it can be, from waterfront and urban revitalization to the parklands of Floyd's Fork, and helping to save a number of landmark buildings, including Whiskey Row, which is now one of our top visitor attractions. I am opposed to this project receiving TIF funds. There are hotels being built right now without TIFs. There are office buildings being built right now without TIFs. There are parking garages being built right now without TIFs, and there are houses being built right now without TIFs. Why should this private development receive a public TIF if these other projects are not? What bad precedent will this set? Are we just gonna TIF the entire city with every new development that comes along? TIFs should only be used for targeted economic development that improves the entire city and adds to the tax base and not drain our valuable tax resources from the police department, fire department, parks, libraries, et cetera. This project is a drain and not a supply of tax resources. It also destabilizes the surrounding neighborhoods since it is not a compatible land use to them. I just saw the uh, graphics up there and I would not want that built near my neighborhood. 
There is ample private funding available to implement this project without a TIF. If the existing former hospital is not demoed, there are millions in preservation funds available to repurpose it. And to the hazardous materials, that is, that is a bogus allegation that says it has to be demoed because of the, these hazmats. If the building is to be demoed, the hazmat must be removed before it is demoed, which negates this false narrative. Instead of upscale, non-compatible development, this property needs to contain uh, more affordable housing, much more than 10%, a senior facility, child care services, a grocery, and other amenities that are compatible with the adjacent neighborhoods. The current developer has no track record of such a massive $249 million project. There are other viable developers who do have such a track record and can begin redevelopment sooner than later if given the opportunity without a TIF or taxpayer funding. One last note, per Metro's own website, there is not a neighborhood listed as Paris Town Point neighborhood. This is, this is, if thus, if this is an actual neighborhood or one created to avoid other or let me see, thus, is this an actual neighborhood or one created to avoid the other neighborhoods that oppose this development? Thank you for considering my comments. Let's all be dedicated to making this development the best it can be for the existing residents and taxpayers of this district. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Are you Mr. Zuckerman? I am. Would you like to speak? Yeah, just oh, okay. okay. Um, Al Corner. Good evening. My name is Al Cornish. I live at 10241 Dorsey Point Circle, Louisville, Kentucky, 40223. And I have come to speak on behalf of the project. And in the way of just a little bit of background in terms of my experience, I currently serve as the vice chair of the Bates Community Development Corporation, and we are partners in this project. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, but in the way of background, I formerly served as Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Governmental Operations, Environmental Services, and Economic Development for the second largest county in Maryland, Prince George's County, Maryland. And as a part of working in economic development, uh, I worked often with TIFs. And I'm gonna tell you that some of the things that I've heard from some of the speakers just thus far this morning, th this, uh, this afternoon, they've mischaracterized what TIFs are. And I hope that that'll be clarified before the evening's out. Uh, but it is a growth uh, misstatements, a bunch of misstatements that have been made. Now, the reason why uh, Bates Community Development Corporation has partnered with them is because of a number of reasons. If you know anything about the Smoketown community, which is adjacent to this project, we are adjacent to this project. And our particular community seems to get the brunt of a lot of negativity. And that site in itself currently is a very, it's a blight on our community. And as a partner working in one of what we believe is the community that has the lowest, the lowest income levels in Kentucky and in this country. We see this project as an opportunity to not only enhance that community, but from our conversations with the developer, the work that will be done in our community, Smoketown. In addition, it's the economic development that's involved with it. And we see opportunities for jobs and business opportunities for those that live in our community. And there have been commitments that have been made in terms of our partnership with this developer. And we believe that this development uh, will only enhance both our community and the Paristown community. Now, 
I believe the TIF, if properly understood, many of you would support it. But with so much misinformation floating around, uh, it's, it's hard to really understand. So I hope you fully understand what this project is, the potential that it has for our community, because it will lift the entire community. And I want you to think about it, because you all don't live in Smoketown. You don't work in Smoketown. Do. You all don't know what's going on in Smoketown and the potential impact it has on our community. So thank you for allowing me to speak, and I appreciate the time that I've been given. And for Hello, I'm Brian Forrest. I uh, live at uh, 1014 Fulham Court, Louisville, Kentucky, 40222, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. So I'm Brian Forrest. Uh, I'm a partner with Steve Smith. I've been a partner with Steve Smith since the beginning. I also am an owner in Hoagland Commercial Realtors and Sun Properties and have developed over a million square feet of properties around town, some being uh, Quartermaster Station, very historic site in Jeffersonville, Indiana, uh, Medical Arts Building on Eastern Parkway, Med Center One on 501 East Parkway or 501 East Broadway, uh, the Big A Shopping Center off of uh, Cane Run Road and uh, Crumbs or Cane Run and Bells Lane. So I do have experience. I kind of sit back in the back and I've been the real estate guy from day one with Steve. Uh, Steve gets all the credit, which is good. So he, I let him take that and run. Uh, he's out of town tonight, um, unfortunately, because I wasn't even expecting to speak. So I didn't know how this was going to run tonight, but. I, I want to back up a little bit. <clears throat> I, I'm very passionate about this project, and you know we've done everything on the lower side, and I I can't figure out in my head how people act like we don't know what we're doing when you go down on the lower Paris Town and there's 4,000 people there last Saturday, and it's probably a half a million dollar boost to the economy on that one day, and and you can laugh over here, but but the other the other developers that have been chosen for this in the past, and in particular, the last developer, he wanted money up front. We're, we're not asking for money up front. We're asking for it in a TIF, which is going to be, we have to build the buildings, everything we're doing here, much like the development plan, to make this work. And, you know, I don't understand, you say there's plenty of developers doing this without this. I mean, why have they not come forward in the last three different times we've been chosen to, to do this project over eight years? I've been here from day one trying to get this project that we can do something. And l let me back up a little bit <clears throat> from that. I lived in Nashville in the late 90s, and I used to see how the west end of Nashville, which is a very fluent area, was pushing into downtown Nashville. And when Steve called me 12, 13 years ago, and he's like, I got this crazy idea. He's like, I want you to come down here and look at this with me, and we're going to develop this whole thing. And I saw the Urban Government Center. I said, that right there is going to be a catalyst for everything, and it's going to start pushing. And then we've got our cousin over here, Nulu. We've got our cousin, Germantown. And they're going to all push, and everything's going to work downtown. And, and every day that I go down there, I think of that. And I think, we're going to make this great, and it's going to turn into this awesome venue. It's going to tie into the, the lower level, and it's going to push into to downtown uh, Louisville through Broadway. And that's what I think about a lot. And the, the next thing I want to talk about is Top Golf. Has anybody been out to Top Golf lately? Have you all been, like, in the last... Six months. Raise your hands if you've been in Top Golf. Okay, so so you, a lot of people that aren't raising their hands, probably the ones that were complaining, saying, "Oh, the ball's great, everything's working out well." We don't want Top Golf here. Well, I went by Top Golf last night, and there was probably 150 cars sitting outside. And what's going on there on a Wednesday night? It looked like a desert out there three years ago, and it was held up for three years by people in this city. The obstructionists is what I call them. That we're not making our city great. And now you look at that and everything's flourishing. There's three new restaurants. The mall is revived. Everything's doing well. So that's what I feel like is going to happen here. Once we get this development going, it's going to take off and, and we're going to go, you know, it's going to help out everything. And, and one thing to emphasize, when we show the TIF and what's involved, I just want everyone to understand the parking lot there is already ours. We own the parking lot where the cottages, someone asked about the cottages. We already own the, that parking lot. So that's why we're building that, but it's all, everything's 
put together there with the uh, the additional land. So uh, I think that's all I have right now. And and I compared this, you know, I, I live in Hurstborn, and it's like if I want to build something in Hurstborn, I feel like Lake Forest is coming, tell me not to do it. And the people in Paris Town are the ones that support us, and that's who wants to do it. And why can't we do it? And we get all these other neighborhoods involved to say no. So that's all. <clears throat> John Gonder. Yes, John, my name is John Gonder, address uh, 1000 Swan Street, uh, Louisville 40204. And um, to answer the question about why can't we do this, it's because it shouldn't be your decision, it's public land. Um, I want to say one thing and uh, to start with it, uh, I'm one hundred percent in sympathy with the people that live around this this building. It's a it's a and it's a dilapidated state. It's not a good neighbor. And uh but the urban government center, it's a, a long and a disappointing display of missed opportunities and a striking lack of vision at the highest levels of local government. And we're familiar with the concept of uh demolition by neglect. And it seems that the driving force at work with the urban government project might be called demolition by trying the public's patience, uh, by dragging this out for 12 or how many years it is now. Now, rather than letting Metro's design professionals fashion a true public amenity, years have been wasted hoping that developers would stumble across a project the public would embrace. In 100 years, if this project goes forward, will this project be an asset to our community? And isn't building for the future the true mark of real leadership? The policy this administration is pursuing is the continuation of policies that didn't work and if completed would deliver benefits that not be benefits that were hoped for. This sounds kind of like the, this dates me here, but it sounds like the Vietnam syndrome. And one lesson we should take from that disastrous policy in our history is to walk away from mistakes rather than bullheadedly pushing merit meritless ideas. Now, even now at the, the 11th hour, this public property, a rare urban jewel, can still be dedicated to a forward-looking purpose, one which would benefit the public rather than simply enriching a private developer. I say close down this uninspired, narrow-focused process and reopen a new process to turn this eyesore into an ambitious, inspirational one which can foster a better, more sustainable future for Louisville which we can do if we will keep our public land for the public. Thank you. I have to start, Jeff, before I read my statement. I really thought this was going to be at the council, number one, but I thought we'd be speaking to the council, so this um, world of electronic connection is way over my head. Right there. Well, I appreciate that, but I thought we would be in uh, the council itself and have uh, it clear who we were speaking to, and uh, and that it would be under the legislative branch, not the administrative branch. So I'm going to make my statement, and most everybody that's come up here has spoken to the audience that is made up of for or against or. That's not what I came down for. I came to speak, um, not even to you, Jeff. I came to speak to the legislator. Um, if I could turn around and look at him, I guess I could, but I want to speak to all of them. So I'll make my statement and then sit down. I want to actually, you're telling me it might be something they could watch or look at later, and I hope that's advertised by you and, and certainly back to the clerk and the president of the council and so forth. So, uh, I'll act as if uh, all 26 will get to see at least what I have to say. I want to speak to each one of the legislators, uh, uh, and I do understand your role and the pressures that um, you have. I spent 24 years of my life as a city legislator. You all together are one of the two remaining branches of city government that by your charge should never accept as okay 
which can only be defined uh, as the lead branch via our mayor, it is, and it's obvious uh, that it's a move to say it, he wants to give the okay, uh, as it turns out, to one specific, um, if you will, developer that came in third in the listing of uh, the ones that were interested. That's last place in my book. Uh, and then, frankly, um, this developer doesn't have the track record. Uh, that's very uh, concerning in terms of saying, we bless you, go forth and spend all this money, including the $20 million TIF. Uh, that is a consideration is that this is a failed project and it wouldn't be the first. What happens next? It's not owned by the city any longer. Who does own it? A bankrupted group. There's a lot at stake here in terms of what's on the table, not this table, a much bigger table with a lot more money on it. What I have seen playing out over these many months now is an intentional action by the mayor to fully negate what needs to be the rightful influence coming from all, but not his chosen neighborhood uh, in, in terms of that there's only one neighborhood to be impacted. What must be recommended next by the city to gain a community benefits agreement must come via the full community benefits committee and not just one member. And this committee, by the way, has been in place for years. It's having ability as a representative committee to influence should be on the basis of a public blessing by the mayor. And if the mayor is going to walk away from blessing all five representatives to work together, then the council needs to step up. And I'm speaking to the council. Um, and, and yes, I am fervent on this. I'm not mincing words. What we need you all is to help assure is that the mayor and this administration is bringing forth a final form of an agreement to you and has an agreement in hand that represents all five representatives of the Community Benefits Committee fully involved and can, and can claim ownership in what would be the recommended Community Benefits Agreement. So who is left to check all of, the, all of this and step up to assure that what proceeds is done the right way? It's clearly now up to the second branch of the city government and it's up to uh, this body uh, of, of the council. Uh, you all do, looking at you, looking at the others here, they do, and I lived it, have the power, and I lived this too. They have the duty. They have the responsibility. We live in a society of checks and balances. We don't live in Putin's world. In closing, I will share that from my civics courses taken as a student eons ago at Bellman, but with great professors, and from my 23 years as a city legislator, what high quality legislators are called on to do most often is their administering checks and balances. It is this branch of city government that can assure good government happens when it looks like it may not happen. And so I beg the council members out there, each of you, to stand up and make a difference here. And I pray you do. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Jeff and the council. Deanna Daniel. Hello, my name is Deanna O'Daniel. My address is 2211 Deering Court, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, 40204. I was not expecting to speak tonight, so I'll just give some informal 
remarks that do concern me. Uh, number one is preservation of uh, a beautiful old building, the Old Baptist Hospital. And uh, we are losing way too many of our older buildings. Our older buildings give our city personality and identity, and we're just like shooting them down like a gallery. And uh, I agree with what Steve said, that it can be cleaned up. We just have not looked at that. I also think if the city, I mean, our business here in the city of Louisville is a lot of tourism. That's what's keeping our downtown vibrant. The locals don't seem to want to go down there. So what attracts uh, people for tourism to this city? It's the interesting buildings, the interesting architecture, and we're just getting rid of them all. And that concerns me a lot. Uh, people don't go to cities to look at urban sprawl. They don't go to look at brand new office buildings. We are building a whole bunch of hotels in this city, and several of them will not be occupied because I believe there are way too many of them now. Every corner that you go past, you see a new uh, hotel construction. And uh, so also the green space that would be lost, there are several beautiful old trees on that property that need to be preserved. And from what I can understand by the blueprint, they're just gonna be gone. But the major thing is if he's asking for a TIF, which means public money, then I think he needs to give us a library. Our library is in the Mid-City Mall. It's wonderful people run it, but it is just not adequate, very homely, doesn't serve us very well at all as far as its facilities. The people that run that library are very helpful and wonderful, so I'm not looking down on them. I say that if this is public money, the public should be getting some benefit from it. Also, many of you know the Mid-City Mall will be closing, okay? Not tomorrow, but it's in plans to be closing within the next few years. And yes, in a block effort event. And where is the new library gonna go? This is a perfect spot. If you've been out to the East End and seen the Northeast Library, you would be amazed at what can be built for a library. And with all the money involved here, we need a new library. The city needs to preserve these older buildings for the personality of the city, and that's a good use of public money. Thank you very much. That covered a lot of what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. You don't want, Mr. Morris, you don't want to speak? Uh, no. oh, okay. Michael Jones, you're. Yeah, uh, I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Cindy Pablo? My name is Cindy Pablo. I live at 1039 Lampton Street in the heart of Paris Town Point. And the reason I say Paris Town Point is because that's where I live. Paris Town is an entertainment district within my neighborhood. And I find it very offensive and disrespectful for people to shorten the name of my neighborhood. That would be like me saying German, original, Moke and Irish. That is, your entire neighborhood is you. Not one business, one entity within that neighborhood. And yes, Paris Town Point is a neighborhood. We are a neighborhood association that back in 1997-98 worked with our alderman, Steve Magre, to become our own separate from German Town, German Paris Town. Now, for whatever reason, apparently, the paperwork did not get finished, but yet we were able to receive funds from the city on numerous occasions. So there is some discrepancy there, but make no mistake, we are a neighborhood. We are small, we are mighty, and we are proud. And based on that information that I just told you, all of you here, I want Councilman Baker and Katie, I'm gonna butcher your name, Katie, I'm sorry, Katie Dittmeyer Home, who is also running for our district council seat. I want you all to understand, the people that live here are tired. Eight years, eight years we have lived across the street from this monstrosity. 
lots of things have happened within that time in our neighborhood. But I think one of the biggest things is once the third developer, like you said, was chosen, that was because the first developer needed the funds and federal information and our money and dollars that was going to come from the scholar house to build their project. They also needed the funding from the parking lot to build there. Not like 12, but it turned out to be 23 houses, I think, once they were named the developer. So that was a big, big mistake because the city didn't own the property at that point. Second person, our group to get the contract, Underhill. He did not have his funding lined up. He uh, was counting on money from the city, even though he knew that was not an option, and basically demanded to use the money from the pandemic fund, pandemic fund to finance this project. Well, that went aside. So finally, Steve Smith and Paris Town Trust were given the opportunity, who had the majority of their funding established. But unfortunately, with the cost rising due to the pandemic and construction costs and the interest rates that have risen, it is now something that is needed to complete this project. The Community Benefits Committee has been, what, about two years or a little more? During that time, they've had little, little, um, I'm sorry, where did my slide go? They've had little guidance from the city of Louisville how to, to run this committee, what to do, when to do it, what is, what is obtainable and what isn't. We've had people leave the committee, people who are untruthful on that committee, people on the committee that were working for their own agenda, not that, not that of the whole neighborhood that they represented. And I'm going, to re I'm going to quote from a neighborhood meeting that I was able to attend back in August 7th of 2023. Some of the comments that the committee members made were, I quote, not our problem, we're not the developer. Don't care if it happens. Another quote, that was quote, quote, I would like to see a park there. And I quote, 100% of the housing, the affordable housing. Those are not obtainable. Those are not something your entire neighborhood wants. That is what certain people within that neighborhood want. A park in my neighborhood, we have less than 20 children in Paris Town Point. We don't really need a park. We could use a dog park because I bet we have 100 dogs in our neighborhood. But why should Paris Town Point supply a park for people from the Highlands, Germantown, Irish Hill, or Smoketown to play in? You have your own park. If you want improvement in those parks, talk to your neighborhood association. Talk to your councilman. But don't threaten a project that is meant to improve my neighborhood and you by association improvements to your neighborhood also. I listened to this group argue, argue over different aspects of the agreement and what they wanted. The builder was going to give us $10,000 to fix our neighborhood garden. Well, we want that $10,000 to fix a park, but that's really not enough. We want twenty dollars or $30,000. Well, I'm only going to give $10,000 once, you know. We'll give it to our park. Like, how is Harris Town Point? They don't need it. We don't really want a park either. We need a garden. We need a place for people to go, to be neighbors, to help feed people within our neighborhood and the other neighborhoods have other people that come in and work also. So those are things that we are doing and we're trying to do. 
and with the help of the developer, developer who now, because of the, all of the problems that have been caused by the, the committee wasting time, it is going to be harder and more expensive for them. So yes, I am for I am for a test that is going to get something done. I personally think, and I hope that every person on this board or this council for the committee for the benefit solution, I'm getting my name things messed up. I hold you all responsible for at least the last year of all the looting, the people coming in and out of my neighborhood. They're stealing our garbage cans so they can fill it up full of copper, copper or whatever else it is that they are putting in there and shoving in their cars four and five times a day. I hold you all responsible for that. I hold you responsible for the homeless people and the looters that park next to my house and at midnight are making so much noise, I have to go find out what's going on. We're having a pizza party over in the government center. He's got five boxes of pizza. He went and got pizza for the group. So he can't even be quiet as a thief. He has to be noisy and party on. And the sad part is Louisville Police Department will not respond. If they do, they might slow down and look, but basically they keep going. And what they've told us, it's condemned. We cannot go in. So that is a tragedy. What's also a tragedy is that Metro government should have a long time ago, long time ago, hired someone to come in and strip those buildings. So that scrap metal, the top or whatever, and reinvested that money back into my neighborhood or any neighborhood for that fact. But the longer we wait, the more damage the building is going to occur. The more problems we're going to have in my neighborhood, and your neighborhoods aren't far off. Because once they're done stripping those buildings, they're coming for yours. But the thing remains. Something needs to be done there. A park is not feasible. And it is a business. They have to make money, whether we like it or not. But they are talking to us, trying to work out an agreement, trying to give money to the neighborhood so that they can do something to improve their own neighborhood. But unfortunately, they can't even agree on that. Everybody wants an equal share. Well, I'm going to tell you, not everybody is, is going through the equal amount of problems and going to have the equal amount of problems when they start tearing it down or they're building it. Paris Town Point from day one has said, we are the ones that are going to be affected the most by whatever happens there. We are asking that you all do what you're supposed to do. You're on this committee because you're supposed to be negotiating on behalf of your neighborhood, but not at the price of my neighborhood. Thank you. Exactly. Oh, Derek. I don't like you. Sorry if I strike you. It's all good. I hear it all the time. What happens to the MCC? All right. Um, my name is Derek Fedalski. I'm the president of the Lindbergh Neighborhood Association and the community organizer. Uh, I've lived in downtown Louisville for 20 years. Um, I have a few different principles that I'd like to talk about and then just some interesting takes on what's already been said. Uh, the major thing, the three things I see wrong with this TIF, I'm in opposition of, uh, once again, giving a developer money when we have many, many other issues in our city, homelessness, affordable housing, mental health and addiction. We just defunded TARC a little bit. We have uh, not funded fully the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. Those should be prioritized over, once again, like we did at the one park, giving one developer who has some lackluster plans, has not completed a community benefits agreement, uh, more money to provide something that they're, it isn't benefiting everyone in the neighborhood or any, everyone in the city. This is taxpayer money. This is East End money. It's South End money. It's Portland. It's Russell. Everyone's money is going to the pot to pay for this one place. You know, we heard earlier that Paris Town Point was, you know, $500,000 economic impact in a day. I'm going to call bullshit. Because I know that those shows aren't booked fully. 
the schedule that was supposed to be there when it comes to concerts and events is very lackluster compared to what it was supposed to be. Once again, proving to the track record of this developer is not quite what it seems to be. Um, definitely not enough due diligence. Uh, lots of negotiations behind closed doors. Attempting to push a vote through committee before this public hearing this week. Um, I also want to ask, didn't this whole start, thing start with this third developer saying that they could pay for the entire project on their own? Now we're coming for double the amount of money that the second developer wanted. A second developer who worked with Paris Point Point and all the neighborhood associations to hear their concerns, talk about senior living, talk about affordable housing. You know, once again, going back to having a park or not having a park, you know, Paris Point Point has 14,591 residents. I find it very hard to believe that there's only 100 kids. Where are you talking about? Right off your website. Um, uh, hold on, right here. I'll bring it up. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. That is my time. Um, you know, the only people that seem to be for this, this, this TIF, uh, same thing with the one park, are the developers themselves. A mayor's office that's intent in giving away taxpayer money over and over and over again in the hopes to bring vitality back. But that vitality is going to come from creating stronger neighborhoods creating stronger community connections. It's not gonna come through building more hotels or developing properties that aren't gonna get utilized by the people who are paying for this tip. Um, there are alternate plans that have been showcased to the other developers that include working with those neighborhood stakeholders. They benefit way more people uh, for far less money than this particular TIF does. Um, some rebuttals from things I've heard tonight, Smoketown, I really question how Smoketown is going to be impacted when there's only 10% of this affordable housing. How do low-income residents who live in Smoketown benefit from a high-rise that they can't afford to live in? It's just going to price them out of these, these, these places. Um, a top golf comparison to this project is apples and oranges. That completely should be struck from the record. That's not even the same not even the same thing. This is a neighborhood, not a commercial center with hundreds of thousands of people who come and shop there every day. This is a neighborhood. Um, you know, parks benefit all. That's one way that you can make sure that everyone who's paying this TIF gets the equal investment opportunity back. Um, and that's really how it has to be. Um, you know, I, I'm just really getting tired of seeing our city time and time again try to come back together after a pandemic, after a somewhat failed police department after you know all the tragedies we've had ups and downs and the only answer this mayor's office and these developers can come up with is to spend more taxpayer money to get things that most of these taxpayers don't want nobody was for the one park and it got pushed down our throats nobody except for the developers and the backers are for this tiff why are we going to let this get pushed down our throats again to that end, I have one last comment. I'll take it off. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me after this, I have automated an email campaign urging our uh, legislature and our city leaders to oppose this TIF. I'd be more than happy to hand you a card and you can get more involved. Thank you. Well, I've Cindy said this everything hold, that I hold, want hold, to say. Kathy Magnuson. Oh, okay. Valerie Magnuson. Hello. Um, I'm Valerie Magnuson. I'm an elected representative of the Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm here um, partly on that behalf and partly as somebody who grew up um, in the neighborhood. I know many of the people here. My current address is 2015 West Main Street, but I grew up at 967 Schiller Avenue, and I um, deeply care about some of the people who I know are Joanne, who I know is um, in support of this project. And I don't have much to add other than I think it'd be wonderful to have more green space. I think we need more affordable housing. Um, I do, since most of the points that I would make have already been brought eloquently by many of the people here, I just want to say that there is a little grove of pawpaw trees that is one of the very few places in this town where you can har harvest ripe pawpaw fruit. 
And honestly, I think that that little grove has more value than the project proposed. Um, the um, project is designed for a world that we're no longer in. Um, the city is facing a climate emergency. We haven't acted quickly enough to um, mitigate the um, climate disaster that is impending. If we continue to do nothing or act so slowly, um, we can't afford to the carbon cost. Um, you know, in addition to all the great points that have already been made, the carbon cost of this project is astronomical. And um, we need to make radical choices as a city. And that means choosing green space over development and choosing, above all, to listen to the majority of the residents um, and the surrounding community who um, have already, I think, on record, um, stated their opposition to this project. So it sounds like this shouldn't go through. Um, I won't be surprised if it does because um, the way that this administration is acting about many other projects um, and choosing not to listen to its con constituents. Um, but I hope for the sake of all of us who live in this community that it, it, it doesn't and that the Metro Council listens to the majority of its constituents who are opposed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Amy Luckett. Hello. My name is Amy Luckett. Um, I've been part of the Community Benefits Agreement Board since um, I believe May of 2021. Um, and you know, I'm just here today to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things that have, you know, come out of that and, and looking into this project. Um, I live at 1427 Christie Avenue, um, and um, I've been a resident of that uh, street for about seven and a half years, um, so most of the time that this has been a vacant building. Um, I just want to say that to me, this property is priceless. You do not find 10 to 11 acres of um, you know, land as an opportunity, as one chunk in an established city center very often. Um, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be creative for land that we all own. This is, this is currently taxpayer land. And something that I don't feel has really been brought out today enough is that Yes, this is about the TIF. This is about, you know, whether you understand the TIF or not, which is super complicated. I, I, yeah. This, once this TIF goes through, then that is just the next part of this land being sold for a dollar for a private developer to make profit on. And we don't get anything down the road. We don't have another chance to negotiate this. We don't have another chance to ask for the park for the future children that live in our neighborhoods. This is our shot to ask for, you know, play space, green space for our families, not just our children. You don't have to have a kid to go to a park. You know, this is all, you can also have a dog and go to a park, you know, keep them on the leash. Um, but also, you know, as Valerie was just saying, we need, you know, if this development is going to happen, then it also needs to have sustainable landscape architecture sustainable design. I mean, again, this is public property and public funding that happen, that once this TIF goes through, then that's just one more thing that we have subsidized. And taxpayers don't need to subsidize a hotel in a town with a housing crisis. You know, 10% at 80% AMI is a poor excuse for affordable housing money. The tools like has, you know, my understanding is that they are supposed to give benefits to the community, not just, not just, oh, this undeveloped land, this currently unused land, then becomes used again online. 
there needs to be actual benefits for the community. And so the Community Benefits Agreement Board has been negotiating for what we've heard our neighbors ask for. We went to the charrette. We saw that people wanted a library. We saw people wanted a park. We saw people wanted a playground and sustainable landscaping. And those are the things that the board has not been obstructionist on. But we've actually been trying to negotiate and say, okay, these are the things we'd really like to see. And we've been met with a complete no, it's not possible, liability, there's, you know, the money isn't going to be there. And, you know, he's already said, well, rising costs, we need more money. What happens when costs rise again? Who's to say that by letting this developer have this TIF, have this land for a dollar, that he actually gets to develop it any faster than, say, Louisville Metro or another developer? We don't know that. There is nothing to hold him to that. No timeline gets approved with this TIF. What does get approved is basically a $1 land sale for something that is priceless. Um, the, the zoning that has been going on for the last couple of years, that can stick with this property. It can, and, you know, it, my understanding is that it would probably allow for anything that may come next. Um, it doesn't mean that the work was in vain, but we can do better. You know, it does not need to be subsidized luxury housing and a hotel in space that isn't available to neighbors and things that have a negative environmental impact on the surrounding neighborhoods, that doesn't have to be what this is just for the sake of time. Because again, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for a piece of land also that is on a high piece of ground, didn't flood in 37. This is a valuable, valuable piece of land. There is, there is not an accurate amount that this has been assessed at, in my opinion. Um, I think I said most of what I wanted to. Um, <laughs> I did have notes, so let me just see. Um, you know, um, all right. I, I, yeah, so I'm just here to speak for the other certain people that don't want this to necessarily happen, I guess. Um, but everyone has their own opinion. I'm not an obstructionist. I was all for Top Golf. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I also see the value in this and I care that everybody gets something for something that is ours. It is taxpayer funded land and this TIF will be money that's taken from the taxpayers and we can't afford it as a city, unfortunately. So that's my piece. Gail Howard. Gail Howard. I'm Gail Howard. I live at 807 Gullion Court. I look directly out onto the parking lot and the government urban center. I'm also president of the uh, Paris Town Point Neighborhood Association. I agree with everything Cindy has said tonight, so I'm not going to reiterate that. <clears throat> but I will tell you that we've already taken a vote, and with the exception of Frank Ford, which he has a right to have every field, we are going to sign the benefits agreement. I've read it. Um, the committee uh, spent two years coming to no solution. Um, our past president and Steve Smith met and came up with the benefits agreement in two or three hours based on what other people have said, not just their own um, ideas. And so we're ready to move on because like Cindy, every morning I look out at a ghetto used to work at Kindred Hospital, and I would walk back and forth at 8 o'clock at night and not have a problem. It was pleasant. Now it's like you better have a gun or, or fear for your life over there. And we're constantly calling the police because people are breaking in. Um, people are living in that uh, metro housing building, and they still metal out every night. They're cutting holes in the fencing. I'm sick of living right behind a ghetto. And as far as a park, who, who's gonna pay for that? The city? That's gonna put us more in debt. 
we have to pay for security. You bet you have to pay for security. And they're going to gain nothing. So that's how we feel, and that's what we're voting for. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Chris. <laughs> you moved it for everyone else, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, my name is Frank Ford. I live at 1038 Lambton Street. I should probably correct the record. I'm not here as a representative of the Paris Town Point Neighborhood Association. I'm just a neighbor. Um, I spoke in opposition to the project at Metro Council in 2022. You spoke at the same meeting. Um, I didn't, I didn't think that the, what was planned, <clears throat> the hotel, the apartment, the office space was what the city needed. And I think a TIF should be granted um, in cases where the community is getting something out of what's being developed. And I don't think that the community is going to get anything out of a hotel and the office building and 450 apartment units. Um, I sit and work from home and look out my kitchen window at what goes on on the property every day. I pick up the phone and call the police. I'm troubled by what goes on. But the solution is not just to start building something. I don't believe that something is better than nothing. Um, there are other solutions to securing the property, and there are other projects to be built there. So I oppose the tip. Uh, Glenn Densinger, again, I'm sorry if I've heard your name. My name is Glenn Spencer Denninger. I live at 1939 Payne Street, uh, 40206 in the Clifton neighborhood. I was unsure of the format. Um, I didn't know I was going to have an opportunity to speak, so um, my remarks will be brief. Um, we're here discussing the fate of uh, public land. Cherokee and Iroquois parks uh, don't just impact the adjacent neighborhoods, they benefit the community as a whole. This is public land that should be designed to impact the greater public, not just developers and investors, not just the adjacent neighborhood, but the community. Uh, to be sure, I feel for the neighborhood, uh, our neighbors in Town Point, who, um, who have had to stare upon this for many years, uh, and uh, for any of our neighbors who live next to Blight, uh, it's becoming a, a worsening problem in Louisville, uh, at least since I was a kid. It, it's just getting worse and worse. Um, but, uh, and, and it's entirely unfortunate this process has been drawn out, in some ways botched, um, and uh, in some ways sketchy and secretive. Um, I do uh, properly understand the TIF and I'm fully opposed to it. Um, and finally, um, Louisville, Kentucky suffers from one of the worst heat island issues in the country. Um, I have long battled with uh, myself about the feelings of uh, urban infill versus suburban sprawl. Um, I think that there, uh, there should be a balance there and when we develop every square inch of a city, that worse, worsening heat island effect is going to be terrible, if it could even get more terrible than, than Louisville, Kentucky. This is a 11, between 11 and 12 acres of public land. It needs to be developed responsibly. It needs to be cared for responsibly. And, uh, and I think that in this moment in 2024, Preserving green space is one of the most important things that we can do, and I think it can be done responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Minnick. I live at 1038 East Breckenridge Street technically in the Germantown neighborhood, but you need to understand that 
Breckenridge Street, East Breckenridge Street is the dividing line between Germantown and Paris Town. So when you say, why should other neighborhoods have a say? It's across the street from my house. I can see it from my house. We are all affected. It's not just Paris Town. Um, the people that live across Barrett in the original Highlands Neighborhood Association are also affected as we are all surrounding it. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you, Councilman Baker, for being here. A lot of the points that I wanted to make have already been made, so all my notes I'm kind of throwing out. Um, this is 11.6 acres of property owned by the government, and I would like to, for context, that's roughly the size of Tyler Park. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a Tyler Park in our neighborhood? And for those that say we can't afford it, Louisville Metro Parks just built a brand new park in the South End. The money's there. If the city wants something, the money's there. I mean, we won't go down that road. <clears throat> um, there's a couple things I want to point out about the process. I started going to the charrettes from day one in 2017. The things we heard were, as pointed out, community green space, community use, library, affordable housing. I joined the community benefits agreement team, and we have maintained, you know, we've, we haven't been obstructionists. We've had to let go of a lot of our ask to try. That's what negotiation is. But the two things that we have decided we are not letting go of is adequate green space with a play area for kids and affordable housing. Um, to Ms. Pablo's point, on my across the street on the Paris Town Point side of my block, I know of at least eight kids, and that's just on my block. There's probably more that I don't know. Um, there are a lot of children in the neighborhood, and we don't have an adequate park. Um, green space is also important for, as has been pointed out, we do have the Louisville, Kentucky has the fastest rising urban heat island effect in the country. Let's not make that the thing we're famous for, you all. We need to turn that around, and this is an opportunity. Um, the developer has put some, what, what is called green space, but it's kind of unclear. It looks to me like just a lawn in between all those cottages. We're asking for green space that is, adheres to LEED standards, that is using native plants, that is sustainably designed, and that looks like a park. Even if it's small, that looks like a park, not turf grass, like you have at here in, out in Christie's Garden. I mean, that's fine, but that's that's not green space. Um, we're asking for truly affordable housing. 80% of area median income for 2024, as just released by HUD, is $54,000. Sorry, what? For for a single person. I'm not gonna ask everybody in here who makes less than that to raise their hand because nobody likes to talk about how much money they make. But I know probably almost all my friends make less than $54,000 and we're middle-aged. I would not be able to afford the housing in this that's supposed to be affordable. We're concerned about what happened at one park. That was supposed to be 10% affordable housing. The developer said, Wow, the costs have risen. We can only do 7% now. And the administration said, okay. So are we going to get 10% affordable housing? Is $54,000 for a single person affordable? That's not acceptable to us. Especially in a neighborhood that has traditionally been a working class neighborhood. And to say, I'm going to build luxury, what is he, he claims, they're going to be the most expensive apartments in town. Like that's coming in to save us from ourselves. We love our neighborhood. It's a vibrant, diverse neighborhood. I know so many of my neighbors. It's, I love it. I love walking around. And I, you know, I, I actually often cross and walk in the original Highlands where there's shade because there's trees there, because there's not a lot of shade in my neighborhood and it's too hot in the summer. Um, we're not against urban density, but this land was an opportunity to create green space, to create community use, to, to use sustainable standards. Why is the government letting anyone build on government-owned property without using LEED standards? That's unacceptable. Climate change is real. And I don't know, y'all, but I'm worried about my niece and nephew and their kids. And I mean, it was 88 degrees last week. 
in April. Climate change is real. Whew. Okay, don't get me started on climate change. Um, I want to talk about the process. Um, so I've been on the community benefits team up until December of 2023. All five of the neighborhood representatives were unified in what we were asking for, all five of us. And as of December, all five of us said, we are not ready to sign this. There was some turnover in the Paris Town Point Neighborhood Association leadership and the representative for that group was picked off. Now, which by the way, his name is still on the website. So I don't even know if that's been official. Uh, but now I don't even know who the representative is. And they're saying one neighborhood is gonna sign this. And somebody from the city is saying, yeah, that's cool. We only need one neighborhood to sign this. So I'm not really sure if that process makes sense to me at all, um, is legal, I don't know, it's all been so vague. But what I really wanna come back to is, like Amy said, this is an opportunity to, to shape our neighborhood, to shape our city. And I hate to think that we're wasting an opportunity that we will never have again because we're impatient. There is problems with derelict property all over the city. I mean, walk down Swan Street, there's there's unhoused people all over the city. There's drug deals that happen on the bridge on where Kentucky and Swan meet every single evening at about six o'clock. Just look at your dog down there, you'll see it. There's needles everywhere. It's not just this property. I mean, he, my mom lives out in the East End suburbs. He has an unhoused person living in, in the parking lot on the other side of her fence. It's a problem. And no, I'm not responsible for it by, by trying to advocate for what's best for our community. Um, but it, I hate to see us lose an opportunity to build something that would really have a positive impact on our community because we're, we're tired of waiting and because this process has been so flawed that now we're left with the developer that came in last place in the community charrette that had, I mean, I remember those meetings, the, the plans were almost non-existent. There was very little for the community. So all we're asking is, government land, and if you're asking for government, you know, you're getting it for a dollar, and if you're asking for a TIF, we need to be getting something more out of it. We need to be getting true affordable housing, community green space, and so as the project is right now, I firmly oppose the TIF, and I ask all of the council people to please vote against it. Thank you. Joanne Robinson. I'm Joanne Robinson. I live at 854 Vine Street and I live directly across from the Urban Government Center. I look at it every day. I, along with Cindy Pablo, are one of the five women who helped annex our neighborhood across away from German Terrace Town. And we did that because we saw our neighborhood as something that could be great. And it is. We have worked so hard since 1997 to make that neighborhood stand out and bring things in there that would welcome everyone. We have people from all over the world coming in our neighborhood now. And that's because of the builder that built that complex down right in our neighborhood. It's like the capital of our neighborhood now. We love it. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. Everybody comes, everybody, we're so diverse as far as money concerned as we are wanting to have that in our neighborhood. We want, we have the poor, we, we, we want to help the poor, we have the medium, and we want more money in our neighborhood too. Because I feel that if you have more money coming into the neighborhood, you're gonna have an equal balance. We didn't have that. We need to have an equal balance. And, and we don't, we, what I was opposed of when this first started, I didn't wanna see poor on top of poor on top of poor like they keep doing in inner cities. You know, you're, we're, we're an inner city neighborhood. We want to be special. We want to welcome everyone. I love my neighborhood. I want my neighborhood to welcome everyone. And that's what we're working on. You keep saying this developer is this and that. He's out, he's out 
it, you can't afford to live there. Well, in the Highlands, hardly anyone can afford to live in the Highlands. And, and our taxes are going to go up whether we do this or not. They're going to go higher and higher and higher because we are in a little neighborhood that is want, people wanted to live there. You know, it's because we work hard. The people in our neighborhood do the work. We work hard on our neighborhood to be safe and sound. We get out all the time. We do all the neighborhood cleanups. We do everything the city asks of us. We, we love our neighborhood. I wish more people loved their neighborhood. I know you all do because you love your neighborhood. You're going to do what's best for your neighborhood. Well, that's what we're doing for ours. We think that this group that's in here now, and we have been for this group since day one. Don't get me wrong. Don't say, I've gone here. I've done here. I, I have, and, and when the groups got in, we stood behind Jeff Underhill when he got in, but it couldn't go through. So we said the people that we wanted in there in the first place, and it's the people, most of the people in Paris Town Point wanted this builder in there because of what he's already done for our neighborhood. So if you all just understand the people that live there, you know, our neighborhood, we're the smallest incorporated neighborhood in the city of Louisville. It's, it's, I mean, how many people can say that except Paris Town Point? You can't say it. I mean, we are. And we have one of the biggest little neighborhoods in this town, in this city. We have more people coming to our neighborhoods than some big neighborhoods. So like, like, like we said earlier, we had 4,000 people in one day come down there for events. I mean, we love this. And we're benefiting from it. You know, our whole neighborhood is because this developer is helping our neighborhood and giving us things to do, money. We need money to help on things that we want to get done. It's getting done. So please, listen to the people that live in that neighborhood. We want this gift. So that's, that's what I have wanted from day one. So that's all I'm going to say, because Cindy touched base on everything that I wanted to talk about, too. So I hope our councilmen understand that Paris Town Point loves Paris Town Point. The people in Paris Town love it. We want this person to go on and build and go on through and and do the great job he's already done. That's all I have. Impact. My name is James Heck. I uh, live at 1134 East Breckenridge Street, 40204 above Seiden Buttons. I am the owner of that business. Um, you all say you had 4,000 people down there last weekend. I had maybe four of them in my bar all weekend. So. When we say it's going to impact the neighborhood like that, you know, does it really? I think I knew a couple of them myself who were going to come there anyway. So um, it seems like I could benefit really well from this, but I see faces out here, people in my neighborhood who do support me already, and they don't support it. I think uh, I would like to see a little more time spent taking on um, what could be done better with it. That's all I have to say. Scratch. I'm, I'm sorry. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Chris, I think it's Willis. Wall. Wall. A lot of what I was going to say there even said so. That's right. So my name is Chris Walls. I am the vice president of the Germantown German Paris Town Neighborhood Association. I've lived in the neighborhood for 11 years. Um, I live at East Breckenridge Street. I can see this property from my front porch. I technically live about eight feet away from where the Paris Town border starts, but all this just to say that it does affect me personally, so I have a personal stake in it. I don't have anything to gain financially if this development does or does not take place. As many people have stated at the beginning of this long process, residents were encouraged to attend the charrettes to offer their opinions on what they'd like to see this public property used for. I don't recall anyone clamoring for a hotel or parking garages or upscale housing, so their suggestions are being ignored at this point. The German Paris Town Neighborhood Association has been vocal about its desire to have this property turned into a green space or a park. I personally organized a campaign to get people to sign a petition for this. I got about 460 plus signatures. Since I was on to the city, didn't really hear much back about that. As people have said, climate change is a real thing. Just a 
Rebecca said last week it was 88 degrees. Um, people have paid a lot of lip service to increasing tree canopy in Louisville, but when we have the opportunity to do it on public land, it seems like maybe it wasn't actually all that important after all. Uh, same thing could be said for affordable housing. Again, we have the opportunity to do something like that. Um, as the development deals been forced to do, a TIF was requested and representatives of the five surrounding neighborhoods have spent over one and a half years in good faith negotiating for some sort of public space, green space, a playground, anything. Instead, the city appears to be cutting a deal with one of the other neighbor associations exclusively, um, with the benefit being that they get a check and maybe a banner. Uh, I don't really think that a check for whatever amount of money is worth the $20 million tip. Um, the, it, I mean, I don't, the details about the survey, because it's, there's not, people aren't really, I mean, I have to learn about the stuff from D WDRB. It's not like they're coming to our neighborhood telling us, or neighborhood association meeting and telling us, here's, here's the deal. So, again, resident suggestions are being ignored. Uh, lastly, the TIF language seems to imply that our neighborhood is blighted, which is personally offensive to me. Uh, it's definitely not blighted. It's a thriving neighborhood. Home prices are going up, which is good and bad, I guess. Uh, there's no doubt this land needs attention. The current proposal appears to be maximizing profit, with the only so-called benefit being the cash handout I just mentioned. Uh, and I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> uh, basically, the loss of an entire publicly owned urban 10-acre property to create luxury housing is going to be affecting the area for many decades to come, and uh, hopefully the council makes a great choice. Thank you. Uh, Amira Granger. Good evening. My name is Amira Granger. I live in the Chickasaw neighborhood, and obviously I don't live near you all, but we are under a 20-year TIF as well. And so I have a few things to share with you for your consideration as you move forward in this. Um, one, I think just be, I'm sad to hear what's happening to, with you all. The divide and conquer is at play all over with these types of things, um, making some neighbors feel like, oh, it's an opportunity, it's gonna be so awesome. And then other people are like, wait a minute, I'm reading the fine print and it's not adding up. So I, I feel your pain in that. Additionally, I ask that you be aware of the 20 year tip. It seems to be the new thing. The tips of the city before were not as long. And, and I think personally that there is a reason for that timeline, that many of us might not be in the same situation 20 years from now. And that person stands to gain what a property for a dollar. How many of us have dreams and things that we would love to execute for a dollar and $20 million loan, or not even a loan, I'm sorry, $20 million grant? Um, especially with contestant number three, when you all agreed on something you liked, why is it that the other um, applicants are not allowed to reapply. So the thing that we're feeling in the West is it didn't start off in the way that it should. I would say the same to you. Can this not start over and let the other applicants reapply? I'm sure the, um, the other developers would have appreciated the opportunity to revise their budgets um, considering today's expectations. If you don't like what they're offering, I, I don't know. But I hope that you all will find resolution. And I, I would say from as a Western resident, I support you as neighbors in our city who don't want our city to be ruined and don't want our city to die. And unfortunately, it seems like developers and the friends of those are taking priority over the livelihood and the wellness of our city and its residents. I get everybody in the room that wants to speak. Okay. Yes, sir. I just, may I have two minutes? Yes. Great. It's hot in here. Um, but I, I just want to speak to everybody. Um, Who are you? First of all, my name is Michael Zuckerman, um, and I'm from, uh, I live outside of Chicago. So why am I here talking to all of you? I'm in town on business, first of all, and nobody asked me to come here. I have no dog in this fight. Uh, there's, but my background is that I am an architect. Uh, I work for one of the largest lenders in the country, and our, that firm does about $20 billion of financing a year. But I wanted to speak to you because I see things a little differently than all of you. I'm, I'm a resident of our community. I'm a dad. I'm a son. I have the same concerns. You're all tired of seeing an empty building, and not just empty building, but one that's an eyesore and so on. So I get it. And you don't want to be coming back year after year after year. 
But that said is I wanted to speak to you because I've seen the property, I've walked the property, and over the past 35 years, what I do is I, I work on projects of this nature and I see things differently than you. And I just feel compelled to share with you what I've seen over 30 plus years. And that first and foremost, I've become an advocate of affordable housing because it's the calling of our time, okay? But there are a hundred different ways to do affordable housing. Uh, I'm a big fan of historic preservation. And in fact, the state mandate, and it goes to the Department of the Interior, is you preserve a building unless it's not feasible to do so. And the most important reason why I'm here is because this is a very unique opportunity for all of you. This is, you look at the site, you walk at it, I see an opportunity because I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these over the years, some of which I participated as a developer, some of which I participated as a lender, an investor, some work, some not as well, and we learned by that, but all of that, this is an opportunity for all of you in the near term to do something that is special. And so, first of all, as a lender, if I thought I could finance an office building with 32% vacancy in the CBD with shadow vacancy creeping over 50%, I'd give you my card and say, I'd love to finance your office building because we do that. I would have a hard time doing that, first of all. If I could finance a hotel here, I would do that as well. Um, but there, that's, that's a, a, first of all, development is very, very hard to finance anywhere in the country today, because interest rates are high, construction costs are high, this is not unique. That being said is that what I've seen in this type of a situation with an historic building in a campus-like setting, the most predominant reuse, and I'm just sharing with you what I've seen all over the country, hundreds and hundreds of examples, award-winning projects, is its preservation of the historic building. And that goes back to what Frank Lloyd Wright said. He said, when you find a property, when you see a, see a property, and you see a gem, you do what you do to it, you do nothing to it. Do nothing in terms of changing the historic character of it. Um, and this is right now, it's an eyesore, but what I see is something that I did personally um, years ago, in fact, just, just a few years ago too, uh, adaptive reuse of an historic building into an award-winning um, property. The most common reuse of these buildings is, a, is affordable senior housing for the benefit of the neighbors. And I'll be very specific with an example before, because it's all hot and everybody wants to leave. Where I live in Northbrook, Illinois, my grandmother, um, rest in peace, she lived in um, a, a senior's community called Crestwood. Crestwood was an adaptive reuse of an historic school. It fell into disrepair, and the property was redeveloped into affordable senior housing, and they gave first priority on the waiting list to existing residents, and second would be to the parents of existing residents. And the reason that was so important was my grandmother, she had her doctor's appointments, she, had, she needed help. And if she lived in a far off place, uh, or it was hard to get to her, we would not be there when she needed us. And having parents living closer to their kids, that intergenerational aspect was life-saving, a real benefit to us. And I saw that all over the country, bringing families together. and. She was able to live in a, a one-bedroom apartment for $400 at the time, $450. That same apartment today is about $650 a month. Hey, she can afford that. Can she afford $2,000? No. Can she afford $1,500? No. She was on a fixed income. But that's the type of use. And then there are senior supporting uses. And when you have a campus setting, you let the site, you let, you let the site speak to you. I heard people talk about senior, uh, a senior center. Well, if you have built-in residence, that makes the senior center that much more attractive. I heard somebody talk about a library. I don't know if there's a need or a use for a library, but you have enough space. That's not the driver. The driver is the historic building. And based on my years of experience, that building can and should be affordable senior housing for the residents of the community. There are financial ways to get that done in the near term. I'm happy to talk to any of you later about how that gets done, but I felt compelled to share that with you because this is a fabulous opportunity. And, and the last thing, people talk about parks. It's a campus. If, what are TIF dollars spent on? Infrastructure and parks. It's, uh, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, in Chicago, we have Olmstead, uh, Olmsteadian parks as well, and I studied that in architecture school. It just could be any park that you want it to be, in any use. And in terms of the users of parks, not just kids, people who walk, anybody who walks, anybody who rides a bike, having a common green space, it can be anything that you want it to be. That's a great use of tip dollars. Actually, the last thing I want to say is, here I work for a, a, a large lender, we don't let financing, we don't let financing drive the decision, because it really shouldn't. It's the use. You have your sources of funds and your uses of funds. What you start with is the uses of funds. What drives the uses of funds? 
what you're going to build. Once you know what you're going to build, then you say, how are we going to pay for it? Because I happen to work for a large firm, we have a lot of arrows in the quiver that not everybody, you know, certainly that's not your business. You're not, you're not in that finance business. We find ways, and any shortfalls that might exist might be done through a TIF, might be done through other, there's monies out there for affordable housing. Um, but let the uses drive the sources. And the last thing I want to say is, um, this is really, it's calling for a P3 development, a public-private partnership. There are many, many ways. Some involve a for-profit developer. Some inv involve a nonprofit developer. It involves government. Everybody brings some things to the table. But what's in common is because there's public subsidy, these are often, and they're typically open book. Open book, and very often with a nonprofit structure, because then that opens up many new types of financing for affordable housing. But I see this as a wonderful opportunity, and I'd love nothing more than to come to the grand opening. Thank you. Well, Karen goes to the um, uh, online folks, so uh, go ahead. Let me just text Selena and make sure she's like, at her computer. Yeah. Maybe go to the next person. Yeah, go to the next. Doug McGee. Tony. Uh, yeah, don't call Tony. Don't call Tony. Yeah. <laughs> We're just making sure everybody's informed them all. Hey, Jeff, what, 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 we're delayed here. Could I? I speak to Philip just for a second. I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned that half the speakers spoke to the audience, maybe a few to you. But I'm really concerned that, that it didn't feel like the life I live when you go and tell that separate branch of government you need to step in. I said it when you were here, and I'll say it again. But I don't know how the other 25 people are going to receive that message. Well, you, you, uh, for a second time, you know, you can um, speak at the upcoming council meeting, which is Thursday. You can sign up and they'll give you three minutes to anybody who would like to speak. So I'm not taking that opportunity away. Uh, well, I didn't yeah. suggest anybody. Yeah, anybody who would like to speak. Jeff was set up for the council. I don't mind sharing with my colleagues. Okay. Yes, we are recording the web action. We will, we will, yeah, the committee. Well, I'm just really sorry about this. Yeah, just so you can hear it and watch this. Yeah. And and a lot of people did correct us on Shaman. We talked to the temp. Yes, yes, okay. sir. And also, anybody in addition to this, to speak at the council. Shannon, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, oh we yeah. can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You need to need a mute button. Hi, everyone. I um, appreciate being able to have made, made the meeting. I'm just landing at our Louisville International Airport, so um, I'm going to get guided by my girlfriend out of here and try to stick with you all on making a few points that I feel like are important. I've been a part of this process, as you all know, from the beginning, I was asked by at the time, President David James, Jeff O'Brien, that whole crew with Greg Fisher to put together a panel of five neighborhoods. My whole point for being on this call 
is that we were called to duty and we have over two years of hours upon hours of dedicated time in trying to do the next right thing for five communities that surround this development. And I just think it's really important to call on council and our public servants that we put in those offices to make sure this agreement, the community benefits agreement that we all dedicated so much time to, so much energy and effort to, that it get five signatures, not one signature. Let's make five communities happy with this development. Not one, it's not all about Paris Town Point neighborhood. I was the president of that neighborhood association. I'm a 30 year homeowner. I'm very proud of that. And I love that community. So I'm just uh, compelling to the to the higher ups to be on board with having five neighborhoods signed. The rules to the game have changed as this whole process happened has happened. And I hope that you guys will go back and read those rules and make sure that um, you stick with the original agreement. Okay. It can be a, a beautiful development. It's the hospital is a historic building and I feel like it needs to be saved. And I also am against the concept of a hotel on the Vine Street neighborhood side of that campus. It needs to be on the Baird Avenue side if a hotel at all is necessary. $20 million is a lot of money. I know other developers that submitted plans did not ask for that kind of money for this development and they were frowned upon because of asking for that money. But all of a sudden now this amount of money is gonna get approved and get passed on for profit, taking the community that surrounds it out of the equation. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. Are we able to get Selena now? Selena, try again to unmute yourself, please. You know, you know, what's the deal? Why are you here? Good on you. She's not a mute. Support of the developer and the tiff, the tiff as it currently is and stuff. How did my mute go off? That's weird. Probably around twenty people showed up. Actually, they're online now. I just walked out with the people in there. Probably. Maybe no one Call 
So just so, oh yeah, just I want to give her an opportunity to speak. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll 20th century technology. <laughs> You know, I actually have to say that I've just made friends with them because I found out they were in the neighborhood and we liked the same thing. So. I, I apologize. All right. There's always something right with WebEx. So. City IT. And I met her at Sign and Fly. Because that's what you do in the neighborhood. Oh, here we go. Hello? there in person and I'm having all sorts of problems with my uh, headset. Um, I came from my 27-story office building uh, this afternoon after a long day that is only ever at 10 to 15 percent capacity for a, you know, 27-story office building. Uh, I'm a big lot from this publicly owned neighborhood center, or government center rather. Um, I've noticed a couple things that have popped up in the proposal uh, today, uh, one being the native plants that are being proposed, and that's great. But if you look at if you look at old Forester Paris Town Hall, um, you'll see intentionally planted winter creeper, which is a terribly invasive species. So obviously, uh, Stephen Smith and company have not done a great job of uh, adding native plants to our community, which are so important. Uh, for, for our ecosystem. Um, we, can't, we, we can't afford to waste this opportunity uh, to do the right thing by expanding the tree canopy, creating useful amenities for a community that we actually live in, and do so without making a millionaire even richer off of our taxpayer um, it, This is a bad plan for the city. It's a bad plan for the neighborhood. And the proposed building plan is more of an eyesore than the existing infrastructure. It does not belong in our neighborhood. And anything else? Yeah. I know that that is it. Uh, will you tell your address? Uh, yes, I am at 926 Glen Street. Thank you. 40204. Thank, thank you, you, Selena. Thank you for bearing with us on the technology. No, thank thank you guys. I appreciate it. Bye. Hey, I'm resourceful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll give. Uh, I'm gonna. Okay. Thank you. We're gonna do a going once here for anybody in the room. Going once for anybody online. Going twice. Okay. We're gonna close the public hearing. And again, I will state the. Next step in this is that it is scheduled to be heard at the Metro Council's Labor, Economics, and Appropriations Committee on May the 7th. That meeting happens at 3 p.m. in the council chambers. Um, and if there are, uh, if, if anybody has any questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to call or email me. Will you put my contact information back up on the screen, please? Um, and uh, happy to do so. And again, uh, we will make the recording available to the Metro Council members via a prime gov or uh, in the manner that the clerk allows us to make it available to the council members along with the um, uh, along with the uh, the notes that we took today. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And Thank you. I have a question about the government center.